My name is Richard August, and I'll be your host. Our guests are former Secretary of State Matt Brown, now co-chairman of the Rhode Island Political Cooperative, Cynthia Mendes, candidate for Senate District 18, and Michelle McGaw, candidate for House District 71. Welcome to State of the State. Thanks for having us. Thank, Thank you for having us. Mr. Brown, in September, you announced the formation of a cooperative of progressive candidates to challenge moderate Democrats, uh, incumbents, many of whom are in leadership positions. Your co-chairwoman, Janine Calkin, is a former state senator who actually beat a long-term conservative Democrat in Warwick District 30 and served one term. Now, Mr. Brown, Ms. Calkin, along with your co-chair, Jennifer Rourke, are big supporters of Bernie Sanders, who is uh, listed as an independent, but a, a self-administered self uh, socialist, really. Why didn't you simply form the Progressive Democrat or Socialist Party rather than a nonprofit entity? Well, our feeling is that we're just real Democrats, that the Democratic Party used to and is supposed to work for the people. But for a long time in this state, it has not. It has failed the people. It's working for corporate interests. It's working for people who are connected, insiders. It's working for the wealthiest. But it is not working for the people. So we have an affordable housing crisis, and this government gives massive giveaways for luxury condo developers. We have people struggling to pay for their groceries and pay for their medicine, and this government refuses to guarantee a living wage to the people while giving tax breaks to the wealthiest. We do not have equal schools for all kids across the state. The, the, this government has failed the people. Democrats are supposed to be on the side of the people. And that's what we're trying to do with the Rhode Island Political Cooperative. We have Democratic candidates who are going to fight for the people, who have a record of fighting for the people, who are going to get in there and start working for the people, make our government work for the people again. Your candidates um, on this cooperative agree to forego contributions from corporations and, and their PACs and, lo and lobbyists. Will they accept money from the politically powerful labor unions and their PACs? We're taking, so this is the pledge. Unlike the current political establishment in this state, our candidates have pledged to take no corporate PAC money, no corporate lobbyist money, no fossil fuel money, no NRA money. And the, and the reason for that is that those are the powerful entities in this state and in this country that have been driving the agenda and have really bought the government and bought influence in our elections. And that's why the government has worked for corporations and wealthy interests and not for the people. So our candidates have all pledged to not take any of that funding. And instead, they are funded entirely by grassroots support uh, and people of like mind who want to have a government that works for the people in this state. And will they accept contributions from labor unions and their PAC? Yeah, so, for, so we, we will not, I'm telling you what we won't take. <laughs> so we will not take contributions from corporate PACs, corporate lobbyists, the fossil fuel industry, and the NRA. And those are interests that have, in, in our view, have really caused a lot of harm in this state. Mm. And so we're going to have an, an agenda that's really for the people, for affordable housing, a living wage, clean energy, equal quality education for kids across the state. The goal that's cited in your website, I believe, is quote, to win seats in the legislature, to elect a new House Speaker and Senate President, and form a new governing majority in order to make government work for the people and not for corporations or the connected. If you accept money from the powerful labor unions, well, and, and say wealthy individuals like, for example, Michael Bloomberg, self seventh wealthiest man in the world, who's pretty liberal and progressive in his views, won't you simply be swapping one powerful group and connected people with another? You know? not, not at all. I mean, look at, look at the way the state has gone and this uh, country has gone. Uh, look at the problem of the burning of fossil fuels. Look at the problem of uh, the peddling of opioid drugs that have killed so many people in this country. Look at the problem of mass shootings. These, these problems are not being solved by our government that is supposed to serve the people because of powerful corporate interests behind all of those problems, behind the fossil fuel problem, behind uh, the fact that uh, in this state, the wealthiest people pay the lowest tax rate, pay a lower tax rate than middle and working class people, behind the opioid problem, behind the gun shooting, all these problems, behind all of them is the power of corporate money in our political system. And so that's why we need to break ties and why our candidates 
are breaking ties with corporate interests in the political process. Michelle McGaugh, you are challenging an incumbent representative, Dennis Canario, in House District 71. Tell our audience about yourself. My name is Michelle McGaw. I live in Portsmouth uh, with my husband. We have lived in Portsmouth since 1991. Uh, we've raised both of our children there, and um, I have always been involved in our community um, in many different ways. You know, when, whenever I see a need come up within the community, I always try to see if I can be there to help. Um, I was very involved in Little League with my son. Um, I was a co-founder of the Portsmouth Trash Collaborative. Um, I'm a member of the Portsmouth Democratic Town Committee. Um, and um, in 2016, when the Democratic Women's Caucus uh, was founded, I uh, quickly joined that and became an executive committee member of the uh, Women's Caucus as well, um, an organization that's working really hard to elect women across the state and support issues uh, related to women and families. And this is your first run for elected office? Yes, it is. Okay. Now, you have said, quote, I'm running for office because I want to provide representation that works proactively to protect our communities and our families. Does this mean that you want government to, a, when you say proactive, does it anticipate what progressives perceive as social and cultural issues and then passes laws and regulations to address them? What I mean by that is that when we are looking at legislation, we want to be looking at legislation that's going to help Rhode Island moving forward. Right now, I feel like a lot of the, or some, not all of the legislation, but some of the legislation that we're looking at has really been more reactive to issues that have occurred rather than being proactive. Um, and I, I know for, for our representative, for example, I really feel that his viewpoint has been more reactive than proactive. We look at things like climate change, uh, and he, when we had a legislative forum, one of the things he talked about was that he wasn't sure that climate change was a reality until he started seeing the water seeping up on his mother's lawn. And I thought, gee, you know, we've been reading about climate science for decades now, it's become a climate emergency, and it's only now that, we're, that he's starting to focus on that. And for me, waiting until it becomes a climate emergency is not the time to be acting. We should have been doing this a long time ago and acting proactively. So that's what I mean by being a little bit more proactive, paying attention to the science and, and looking forward to how we can protect our, our communities. You've also said that, quote, I've seen barriers to progress and suppression of the voices of the voters. What are these barriers and, and how are voters being suppressed? Well, one of the things that I, I testified on uh, in the last session was um, there, there was a push for a change to the rules within the House and Senate. Uh, there was a reform caucus, 19 members who came forward and wanted to change the structure of how bills were reviewed and bills were passed. Um, right, na right now, um, or, or prior, prior to the, that rules discussion, what, one of the things they were pushing for was something, something as simple as being a, given time to read bills before they had to vote on them. So uh, part of the Reform Caucus said, we would like to proactively have 24 to 48 hours to read a bill before we have to vote on it. Uh, to me, that is a barrier to good government, to not have the opportunity to do that. Uh, one of the other things that they were pushing for, in order to suspend the rules, uh, it only requires two people uh, the, the, in the House, for example, the, the majority leader and the minority leader. So they can suspend all the rules um, with just two people. And that's exactly how we end up in a situation where we have hundreds of bills being voted on in the last two days of the session. Uh, things are put off and put off, and to me, that is a barrier. Uh, so in the last two days, now we are suspending the rules. We, are, we have our legislators who are being asked to vote on bills that they haven't even read yet, and we're pushing through, you know, we're pushing through on hundreds of bills in the last couple of days. To me, that is a barrier to good government. Uh, when that reform caucus came forward, uh, they were met with some resistance. Um, 
And those caucus members who spoke out for, for a more transparent and better government you know, were um, under very close scrutiny for the rest of the session. Um, and so I just think that we shouldn't be, we shouldn't fear retribution for speaking out for better government and for a better opportunity to represent our constituents. Ms. Mendes, you are taking on incumbent William Conley, uh, District 18 in Pawtucket. Tell their audience about yourself. Hi, so um, I am, my name is Cynthia Mendes and I am from Riverside. Uh, which is part of East Providence. Um, so District 18 is East Providence, which is Rumford, Riverside, and parts of East Providence, as well as Pawtucket. Um, so it's an interesting district uh, with amazing people and families. Um, my Raising my daughter there, my teenage daughter, um, and we love it, and we've been in Rhode Island my whole adult life. So um, it's very, very important for me to have a community that feels like they're represented in the state house. Um, I'm not sure that's the feeling right now, and I, that's why I feel like it's the time to, to take that step in and give them the voice they deserve. And this is your first run for elected office as well? It is, right. yes. Okay. Um, now you say one of, the, one of the things in your bio, it says you've worked in healthcare for many years, so you have a great deal of interest in this. Tell us what kind of positions have you held in, in the healthcare industry? So I've been both a clinician in the dental field as well as an administrator. So particularly as working in, in the administration end of things, I was able to see how families suffered when they thought they had coverage that they did not, or an insurance, com an insurance companies Un left people undercovered and what that meant to families to sit across from a mother and watch her cry because she wasn't sure that she wasn't aware that their insurance company left huge gaps in their coverage. Um, it, it was heartbreaking. It was frustrating. And as a mother to be able to understand, understand that and then a healthcare worker to understand how important it is to get the care that you need and knowing that people potentially may be putting off the care that they need because of the cost is unfathomable to me. Now, you describe yourself as, quote, an avid champion for Medicare for all. Yeah. And now the Congressional Budget Office says that it would cost $32 trillion over 10 years to do a national Medicare for all. Our neighboring state of Vermont and the state of California, which is the eighth largest economy in the world, both investigated, <clears throat> excuse me, a one player, payer universal health insurance plan for all their citizens and both states found that it would be too expensive. How do you propose to pay for this entitlement? Well, I think step one would be investigating, right? To, to have that conversation and look into it. And there are ways to create funding. Um, there are people right now we're looking at creating our own energy, which would give us the ability to have a surplus of funds. And so there, there are options in our funding, but what's not an option is leaving our families without coverage. That's not an option. And, and to ignore that, not have those conversations, I don't feel is, um, is one of our options. So having conversations about the funding is an option. Thinking a little bit beyond what our corporate friends tell us to say is probably an option. So maybe thinking beyond that about how we can create our own energy. So we're currently creating 3%, less than 3% of our own energy. We're sending billions of dollars out of the state. So what if we created our own energy? What if we had a surplus coming in? And then in addition to that, using those funds and investing it back into the health of the people and, and back into, into our state. Um, there's, there are a lot of ways of doing it and it doesn't take um, you know, reinventing the, well, there's, there, there are things existing right now. Um, You're talking about energy though, I think you, uh, the energy is a grid. Mm -hmm. So if we generate whatever amount that we don't need or it goes into the grid and then it's redistributed by mm -hmm. the grid. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, it's not really analogous to health insurance, is it? I'm talking about funding. So you asked me about yeah. funding, and so I'm, I'm saying there's a lot of creative ways to talk about funding. Okay. And so co changing the way that we address our budget, we can explore that, but then also the way that we address our budget um, and creating our own energy and, and increasing our funding. That way is an option. There are other options, but the biggest option is the fact that um, it is possible. And what is not an option is leaving our, our families undercovered by their health insurance. And the fact that we give in health insurance companies a larger voice than our own families in the community. The fact that they are 
at the state house that they are lobbying um, the fact that they are funding our representatives that's terrifying to me because i know that the families are working really hard and they're having to choose between their health care and their mortgage or their rent and they don't have time to go up to the state house and hope to be heard hours after a lobbyist had had all their time and um and then only to be ignored i don't think that's fair can, no. I, just, can I just add a little something for that just as a reminder that as a country, we are spending almost $500 billion in administrative costs mm. associated with our healthcare system. So if we eliminate the middleman in our healthcare system, we can add $500 billion into that to provide better care. And that's a huge part of being able to pay for Medicare for all. Who's going to administer Medicare for all? We will certainly have to set that up. And I'm not saying that that will cost would go away entirely but it would not be a $500 billion industry uh, with huge profits going to corporations rather than going to healthcare. The Medicare for all um, that has been, <clears throat> excuse me, discussed, and even some of the candidates for president have actually said this would eliminate the need for private health insurance companies. So one of my questions is, what is gonna happen to the tens of thousands of middle, middle, um, middle income wage earners to work for Rhode Island Blue Cross Blue Shield, United Healthcare, and the other insurance carriers that do business in Rhode Island. What's going to happen to all those employees if we eliminate that industry? Well, there's going to be a transition, like with any big transition. The question is, do we have the right health care system now? And the mm -hmm. answer is clearly, we don't. We have people who are uncovered, which means, just to be clear, if you get sick and you're poor, you die under this system because there's no care for you, because you can't pay for it. We're the only advanced country in the world where that happens. And this is the United States of America. We talk about the fact that we care for human beings here, right? We're the only advanced country in the world where we let people, because they don't have enough money, die because they don't have health insurance. Every other country has some form of universal health care coverage. So you can point to a state that tried it and failed, but I would ask you to go up and see how powerful were the health insurance and drug company lobbyists in that process. Mm -hmm. Was it really that it wasn't the right thing to do, or is it that what's right for the people gets buried under piles of money from lobbyists from the corporate interests of this, on this issue? So you know, we got to be honest about how we ended up here. We didn't end up here because it's the best system. I don't think anybody thinks that. We ended up here because in our political system, over the last 30 or 40 years, corporate interests have bought influence in the system, and the people who don't have health care or are undercovered in their health care have lost out. So yes, of course there's going to be a transition, like there's going to be a transition from burning fossil fuels that's killing the planet to clean energy that's going to create jobs and money and income for people in Rhode Island. There's going to be a transition, but that's where we need to get to. I want to get on to a topic that you mentioned, and that is um, affordable housing. And the most recent report from Roger Williams University's um, Housing Works RI shows that the price of single family houses and apartments is becoming out of reach for many Rhode Islanders. Now, the threshold for determining whether uh, housing is affordable is considered to be 30% of income. And this is a, really an old rule of thumb that mortgage lenders used in the past and is. Uh, really was based on the fact that people were expected to come in with a 20% down payment of the purchase price. <clears throat> Today, there are many programs, of course, as you're well aware, for first-time home buyers, veterans, and other groups that require zero down payment. Ms. McGraw, the Housing Works report says, the funding for affordability at both the federal and state levels remains significantly less than what is needed to ensure low and moderate income Rhode Islanders have housing choices that are affordable to them. That's what Housing Work Rhode Island says. Do you have any idea how to plan on increasing government funding in Rhode Island for affordable housing? As far as, as finding the funding for it, um, yeah. I, I think that's something that's gonna take a, a lot of research and I think a lot of people, people have been trying to figure that out now for, for a long time. But I think it's definitely something that we need to provide more focus on. Uh, when you look at that report, one of the things that uh, really struck me was how few municipalities are, are following the current regulations that we have. So we're saying that each municipality has to have 10% 
of their housing available as affordable or middle income housing. And what we saw from that report was that only six communities uh, were in compliance with that. Now we have a, a commission that's supposed to be overseeing that and my question is what's going on with that commission and what are we doing to enforce that within communities? And I agree, we need to be doing more research as to figure out where that money is gonna come from and how that's going to be paid. Uh, but we also need to, to be um, cognizant of the fact that we have these re requirements for municipalities that we are not um, complying with right now. And it speaks to, to me, it speaks to the vulnerability that has left people families, right? We, the fact that we have leadership ha that have formed this committee and yet has not investigated and, and is okay with 33 of the 39 municipalities not meeting the standards and what is being done about that. This will expire in 2020, is that correct? This, the, 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 the commission's the will commission expire, will expire in March 2020. 2020. Yeah, yeah, and so if it's gone under the radar thus far and have not even met the goals thus far, are they hoping that it will go away, that, it, that no one's going to pay attention, that more families are going to suffer and not be able to af have affordable housing? Um, the fact that it's been ignored um, and that the standards that they set have not even been kept is terrifying. So yeah, we need to have that conversation about affordable housing, and we need to have it with people that we trust to represent the people, um, that the standards that we have are just not numbers on a paper, but they mean something to families that cannot pay their rent, that cannot pay their mortgage and having people that are invested in upholding the law that they were committed to do. And these are ex excellent points. I, I would add on the funding question um, that, um, first of all, the affordable housing crisis, to be clear, is a problem for everyone but the rich. It is really something that the middle class, the working class, and the poor mm. are struggling with, at, in different ways, for sure, and with different levels of urgency and acuteness. But almost everyone in this state, to the, to the point of the report, essentially can't afford the housing that, that we have here. And I think this is an excellent point that, that uh, Michelle and Cynthia have made about the oversight and the regulation of this and the failure of the government to, to, make, to, to solve this problem. The funding question, I, I just think, you know, why, why are we not asking about the Fane Tower? Where are we going to get the money to give that out of state? corporate developer to build a luxury tower that nobody needs an apartment in. But we're not, but, but we never, you know, we don't ask them, where are we gonna get those millions of dollars in tax breaks to give to that company? But when we ask about healthcare, or we ask about what we have, a, we have a poli our, our, our housing policy means, it's a decision that the government has made. They have decided that everyone, will, everyone but the rich, the middle class, the working class, the poor, will struggle just to keep a roof over their heads and over their children's heads. And it is the policy of this government that some people will not be able to, so some people in this state live outside. So given that situation, why is it so easy for our government to find money to throw at corporate developers, but yet we feel like we have to wring our hands to come up with a little bit of money to help people not live outside in the state or for the middle and working class to afford their housing. The money is there. It's what we choose to do with it and, and it's who has power in the system. Mm. And we think the people should have power to at least keep a roof over their heads. So are you suggesting that someone who comes in and has a proposal to develop affordable housing should be given the same kinds of consideration and breaks? Uh, more, yeah. And it should be required. If you're gonna get any, if you're gonna get any kind of tax break, to build, to build, you know, some kind of project, you you darn well better meet these requirements that there is affordable housing provided, and and you know some of these tax breaks shouldn't be given at all. I mean, look at the tax breaks that have been given, the handouts to corporations while people are living, are struggling just to pay for their their basic needs. These are not like we've been talking about. We are not. The, the candidates who are part of the Rhode Island Political Cooperative are not out there saying we're going to give everybody everything they want. What they are saying is people, the government ought to be working to make sure people have what they need. Mm. They need a roof over their heads, and their children do. They need health care. They need quality schools, and government ought to guarantee those things. The, we keep hearing the term the rich and the wealthy and corporations and so forth. Um, one of the um, planks, or if, if you will, in, in your website says, 
corporations and the rich aren't paying their fair share of taxes. And you've obviously yes. decided that. Rhode Island's median household income in 2017, according to the Housing Work <coughs> RI study, was just north of $58,000, which means half of the people, half of the households, excuse me, have more and half have less. So I'm trying to figure out who are, who are the wealthy? Um, is it anyone above the median or Exactly. Who is considered rich? Well, you keep using the terms middle class, you know, so. Yeah. Well, you can look at like the, uh, the uh, Economic Policy Institute or the Economic uh, Progress Institute here and the numbers they've looked at. They've looked at numbers for uh, the tax cuts that have been given to people making $500,000 and above, for example. I mean, that's a, a measure you could look at. Uh, you look at the corporate tax cuts. If you look at the tax cuts for people making $500,000 and above, and corporations over the last 40 years, uh, they're massive. They're massive. And, and you know what happened after those tax cuts were made? It was, it was, it was trickle-down economics, right? That was the idea. We're going to cut taxes for the rich and corporations, and no state did it as radically as this state over the last 40 years. Slash the taxes for those wealthiest at the top, they're talking about the people at the top, and for corporations. It didn't trickle down. I mean, what have we been talking about here? The schools, literally, the school buildings are falling apart. The hospital system is bankrupt. Uh, people are living on the street. It didn't trickle down. Communities are in rough shape. And what happened with taxes? Local communities were essentially compelled to raise property taxes, which hits who? The middle class. So that's how this whole thing, that's how this cycle has worked. And, and my feeling is that why has that happened? It's because of the, the undue, outweighed, corrupt influence of corporations and money in the political system so that the government isn't working for the people and we're not working to solve these problems. And that's what these candidates are, are gonna go up there and fight. Because we hear about it. So my friends, they're okay with corporations paying the same amount of taxes we pay, the same tax rate. They're okay with that. Across the board, we're okay with that because my friends are in soccer fields and in, and in classrooms, not in boardrooms. So uh, what makes me nervous is that our legislation and the people that are making our laws are, are very close with people in the boardrooms. And so they are hearing those voices. So my, maybe their friends think it's a good idea for us to pay a higher tax rate than corporations, but my friends in the soccer fields and the classrooms think that corporations should pay the same tax rate we do. One of the things that occurs to me, and I did, I did an analysis, I don't have it in front of me right now, is we keep getting this impression that um, all, everybody or a good portion of the people in the legislature are in the pockets of corporations. And yet I look at that and I see that there are actually people in the legislature, some of whom are in leadership positions, who have close ties to labor unions. There are t uh, teachers, there's a fair number of firefighters and police officers, both retired and active. Um, so certainly, and there's small business people as well in the legislature right now. Um, so we're almost out of time, but I'd like to get your reaction to the fact that <coughs> what, why is the legislature falling short of your goals and aspirations for it? For me, I know I've testified at the, at the State House several times. And when you go into a hearing at the State House, the first people that get to speak are the well paid lobbyists. For some reason, they are give, their voice is given more importance than the people of the state who those laws are going to impact. And that makes me question where our priorities lie. Okay, you want to add to that? We've got about a minute left, so go ahead. <laughs> um, I just feel that we don't necessarily need a permission slip to represent our communities. We, it's okay for us to serve our communities in every capacity. It's okay for us to live in the wake of bad legislation. I think it's also okay for us to be the voice of our communities. And if, if people that have been in legislation before, they, they're, that's okay, but they are gonna have to be in touch with their communities, and I trust that I'm in touch with mine, and I feel like I can represent them well. We want to thank all of our guests. We're really out of time. I didn't get to half of the material. <laughs> and we'd like to have you come back and explore some of these topics further as we get closer to the election cycle. Good we luck in that. your campaigns. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, you very for much. joining us. And thank you, audience, for watching State of the State.